Hello. Um, in all seriousness, thank you for inviting me to speak um, to you this evening. And I think the powerful words of this evening have already been spoken. Um, I suppose what I'm going to do in the course of the next 20 minutes is to talk less about the direct experience, which we've heard and is honoured in the room, and more to think about some of the kind of wider framework that the Christian tradition, and in particular the Catholic social teaching tradition, has used to try and give language and a response to the kind of cries and the experience that we've heard in different ways this evening. Now I'm going to start with a poem. Um, it's a reasonably long poem, but hopefully you will see as I read it why I'm reading it in full. And you're going to start thinking from the beginning that it's a slightly depressing poem, but stay with it because there's a reason that I'm using the language and it's to take us somewhere more hopeful, um, but it starts with language which is severe. The poem is called To Posterity, and it's by the German poet Bertolt Brecht. And he wrote it just really uh, before the Second World War, when he was feeling that he was living in times that were quite dark. So, To Posterity. Indeed, I live in the dark times. A guileless word is an absurdity. A smooth forehead betokens a hard heart. He who laughs has not heard the terrible tidings. Ah, what a time it is, for when to speak of trees is almost a crime, for it is a kind of silence about injustice. And he who walks calmly across the street, is he not out of reach of his friends in trouble? It is true, I earn my living, but believe me, it is only an accident. Nothing that I do entitles me to eat my fill. By chance, I was spared. If my luck leaves me, I am lost. They tell me, eat and drink. Be glad you have it. But how can I eat and drink when my food is snatched from the hungry and my glass of water belongs to the thirsty? And yet, I eat and I drink. I would gladly be wise. The old books tell us what wisdom is. Avoid the strife of the world. Live out your little time, fearing no one, using no violence, returning good for evil. Not fulfillment of desire, but forgetfulness passes for wisdom. But I can do none of this. Indeed, I live in the dark times. I came to the cities in a time of disorder when hunger ruled. I came among men in a time of uprising and I revolted with them. So the time passed away, which on earth was given me. I ate my food between massacres. The shadow of murder lay upon my sleep. And when I loved, I loved with indifference. I looked upon nature with impatience. And so the time passed away, which on earth was given me. In my time, streets led to the quicksand. Speech betrayed me to the slaughterer. There was little I could do. But without me, the rulers would have been more secure. This was my hope. So the time passed away, which on earth was given me. You. You who shall emerge from the flood in which we are sinking, think, when you speak of our weaknesses, also of the dark time that brought them forth. For we went, changing our country more often than our shoes. In the class war, despairing, when there was only injustice and no resistance. For we knew only too well the hatred of squalor makes the brow grow stern. Even anger, injustice, even anger against injustice makes the voice grow harsh. Alas, we who wished to lay the foundations of kindness could not ourselves be kind. But when you, at last it comes to pass that man can help his fellow man, do not judge us too harshly. In 1968, 
The Jewish social philosopher Hannah Arendt published a book in honour of that poem. She entitled the book Men in Dark Times. There are women in it. Each chapter was devoted to an individual who Hannah Arendt judged to have lived a life of substance, a life that in its humanity illuminated the darkness. The three things that draw me this evening to a reference to that poem and to Arendt's book are these. The first is Arendt's claim that each generation lives through dark times. And the challenge is not to argue about whose times are the darkest, which generation had it hardest, than it is to find ways to name and to resist the darkness. Arendt tells us that we can always claim our freedom to begin again in the mess of things, a message Liz Truss might be wanting to hear this evening, and also to do so with others, honouring human dignity and basic justice. The second striking thing, to my mind, about what Arendt has to say has echoes of something that Pope Francis often says. Realities are greater than ideas, which is bad news if you're an academic like me. <laughs> Arendt's version of it is this. The thing that most illuminates the darkness is not concepts or cleverness, not statistics or even ideas, not the perfect analysis that nails it all, but lives that are, that are able to take into themselves the conditions of the world, and even when unsure and confused about those conditions, walk the pathway with those in greatest need of companionship and justice. These people, Aaron says, and Pope Francis says, are the deepest bearers of hope in the darkness. In his social teaching, Pope Francis was repeatedly called in exactly this vein for us to attend urgently to what he calls the wounds of the world. In response to the theme of this evening, his social teaching is clear. Compassion is the beginning of the journey, but it is not its end. The path towards a truly Christian vision of justice begins with a willingness to be moved, to be moved in your very guts. That's the language of the Good Samaritan passage in the Greek, to be moved in your bowels. So to be moved, to be willing to be moved, even to be distressed by the injustice of the world, but then to learn how to act on that with others so that what distresses us personally becomes public in exactly the way Penny was talking about with her own experience, that it can be heard by all. In the 20 minutes I've got this evening, I want to share just a little bit about some of these themes about compassion and structural transformation how they find a language in the vision of Catholic social teaching. And we're gonna to touch on just two main themes given the time. The first is the way in which the gospel and the Christian social tradition across Christian churches talks about the principle of just distribution or just access to goods. The second is about a vision of human dignity that is central to the common good. In other words, you have to distribute goods justly, but the Christian tradition is not just a redistributive project. It's one that talks about a completely different vision of what it means to be a dignified human being. And both of those things are necessary for a Christian version of social justice. So the first principle of Catholic social teaching, of the church's social teaching is, and this does not trip off the tongue, the universal destination of goods, okay? Now that's a horribly off-putting phrase, but it contains a radical message. This is the basis on which when journalists look at what Pope Francis says, they say he's a communist because they misunderstand the way in which the universal destination of goods is based um, on a gospel vision. So this principle of the universal destination of goods teaches that the created goods of the world are intended by God to meet the needs of every living person in every time and every place 
and through all generations. So therefore, the right to private property and the right to have access to all the basic goods of day-to-day -day life, food, housing, water, energy, they're all relative to that principle. So you don't have a right to own things, absolutely, if others are in material need. There's something wrong with the distribution of the created goods of the world, if that's the case. So the message is simple and stark and sobering, but also life-giving. What human beings are asked to do is to steward goods well so that the needs of all are met. It's that simple and that difficult. So our human needs are equal and our human right to benefit from a creation that we do not possess, but we receive as a gift, is equal. The early church fathers had this fantastic vision that wealth should flow through the community like a healthy river. So it should flow with movement, touching all the places. Wealth in a community should not be like a stagnant pond that sits in one corner. Its ability to flow through a community and um, to be a healthy and living source of water. So this is the basis for a Christian social teaching on justice. Fair distribution, ensuring that the basic material needs of all without exception, that means not just people with citizenship rights, can be met. If you're in the territory, you're of the territory, whether you have a passport or not. So this is where the tradition of campaigning for just wages, adequate housing, food that's decent and nutritious, less inequality comes from. Now, using this teaching, Pope Francis has argued that there's no moral justification in a world with abundant resources for anyone, a single person, to live with the injustice of no or poor housing without adequate heating, food, basic clothing, or, and this is one of the key themes, the availability of meaningful work that pays a living wage. And then also, as we were hearing at the beginning, Pope Francis has been a key explorer of the basic income as well. So a cost of living crisis then is a crisis in our ability to justly manage access to the goods of the earth. It's a failure against the first principle of the social order, and it disproportionately is a failure that affects those who are already on every fault line of vulnerability and marginalisation. Now, I don't want to spend the evening simply denouncing. Instead, I want to share something that I think is a positive and distinctive vision that helps us build something that looks like a better society, one that truly serves something that we can think of as the common good. Now, the first thing to say, and this is going to have echoes of all sorts of the reports that we heard in the first part of the evening. The first thing to say is that a Christian contribution to the common good is always both personal and structural. So it's a call to put your hand in your own pocket or give of your own time or give of your own energy. But it's always also structural. So it's both of those things. And the two are deeply connected, the personal and the structural, is what I want to say. So firstly, the personal. The earliest Christian writings about the common good draw upon scripture, especially Matthew 25. That's the common good, good text for the early church fathers. And here, in Matthew 25, the common good is utterly concrete and practical. So if you think, gosh, the common good sounds like a really complicated, difficult thing, Open Matthew 25, it's very direct and very clear. It, needs fe it means feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner, comforting the sufferer and the mourner, hosting the stranger and so forth. There is a list with such clarity that you can be in no confusion or doubt about what the common good means as a basic starting point. The best citizens and the best Christians in Matthew 25 are those who know how to mourn, how to weep, how to rejoice, and to do so for themselves, as well as in accompaniment of others. Now these, of course, are very practical visions of compassion, but they have at their heart 
a vision of what restoring a deep sense of human dignity to those who feel indignity in their lives looks like. And again, we've heard that across this evening in the different reports. And it's here where I think the Christian tradition has something really vital to say. And I'm going to suggest this evening that there are three distinctive facets or features to a Christian understanding of social dignity, of human dignity. The first is that what makes us dignified as human beings is, yes, being made in the image of God. Well, that already implies the idea of relationship. So the first distinctive feature of a Christian understanding of human dignity is that what makes us dignified is our capacity for relationship. Okay, it's our capacity for relationship with our creator and with our neighbor. So one of the problems is that we live as Christians in a society where we are told constantly that being dignified is to be self-sufficient, to be self-contained and self-reliant. To achieve, in fact, all of the most important goods in our life, the things that we tend to want most as human beings and that turn out to be good for us, it requires us to have and to sustain relationships with other people over time. We don't get the greatest goods by ourselves. We only get them in relationship with others. So the first principle of human dignity is relationship. The gift of it, the need for it, and the problems that accrue in our lives when relationships break down. Now, this teaching has real edge in the context of what we're talking about this evening for two reasons. We live in societies that sell us daily the myth of self-dependency as the highest goal. We blame individuals for their poverty and we make them responsible for finding solutions alone. In truth, at the point in our lives when things fracture for us, our need for relationship is greatest. And this leads to a second feature of a Christian understanding of human dignity Dignity is not something that we possess merely for ourselves. Dignity is something with which we are socially entrusted. So my dignity is entrusted to you and your dignity is entrusted to me. At times in our lives where we can least see our own dignity, illness, poverty, old age, young age, Others often have to carry that dignity in trust for us to help us to know it again in our lives or to remember it in something. If you're thinking about caring for somebody with dementia, for example. The indignity of poverty is a failure on a collective level of that social entrustment. And the gospel calls us to renew that, to hold it in trust. The third feature of dignity that I think is really important for a Christian social vision, and here it's really interesting that um, I think it was Mary earlier was quoting um, from Martin Luther King's um, Good Samaritan um, uh, sermon. Here I want to draw a little bit on the work of contemporary black theologians who are working as part of the Black Lives Matter movement in the state on our writing a new theology of human dignity, drawing from their experience of a new generation of civil rights activism. So the third claim is this, because dignity is something social, it requires not just, <clears throat> not just words, but it requires performing into action. This means when social structures in our world deny dignity, it becomes something that we have to struggle for. And as the black theologians writing on dignity now write, we refine dignity, we refine dignity in the act of struggle. So it's in the process of struggling where dignity seems most absent that we are able to refine dignity. So the American black theologian Vincent Lloyd writes of the importance of this idea specifically to Martin Luther King Jr. and to the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement. Lloyd argues that the insight of black Christians is that dignity is not just the goal of the struggle, the end point, 
but dignity is found in the struggle against what is evil or unjust. The special insight of the black tradition is that with time frozen, dignity can seem like an abstract claim to a status, but in the moment, in its natural habitat, dignity names friction between the world as it is and the world as it should be, and it places us in that tension. Dignity then is something you do, a practice and a performance. Dignity a struggle begins then with naming what we know dignity is not. So Lloyd notes sometimes dignity then means struggle on the grand scale. If we know dignity is not in the current benefits and welfare system, if we know dignity is not in the current immigration system, then those are realities we name and there is a struggle on a major grand scale, if you like, against those structural injustices. But sometimes that struggle for dignity is utterly personal and it's simply the struggle for survival. Both of those struggles are equally dignified and both of them are what change institutions um, and societies. Vincent Lloyd calls that dignity in motion. So these thoughts, as I'm drawing to a conclusion, about the common good practices in Matthew 25 and about dignity in this more structural sense, they're not separate questions. They come together in a Christian call for a revolution in both our social relationship, how we relate to each other at the ordinary everyday level that we've been talking about this evening, and also how they change institutions. So this vision calls for a revolution that is both relational and distributive, both of those things. In fact, and this is the final twist of the argument I want to make, they suggest that maybe our institutions will only be reformed through a relational revolution. What would it be like if listening exactly to the kind of experiences of the Poverty Truth Commission what would it be like if we measured the moral performance of our institutions and organisations in terms of their ability to meet real human need? To build towards genuinely common goods? What if it forced us to ask, what are the relational goods that an energy market needs to take account of, that the benefit system needs to honour? that the immigration system needs to protect, that the prison system needs to nurture. Beginning with a deep relational listening to the personal goods and the material goods that are basic, utterly basic, to fostering stable relationships in people's lives, to trust, to generating social solidarity rather than division and mutual suspicion, to deep dignity, wouldn't that be a beginning that changed both our localities and also many of our structures? To conclude, Pope Francis is anxious to place before us two temptations of what he calls the bad spirit in our contemporary world, church and society. The first is the risk that whatever side we are on in social debates, we end up feeding the dynamic of polarising and opposing, of failing to see that we are all in the end brothers and sisters who need to work out urgently how to live together better in a common home. The second risk of the bad spirit is the temptation to detach and to despair. And interestingly, Pope Francis thinks that the danger of detachment, a kind of individual well-being culture, or simply saying it's somebody else's problem, is just as big a problem, and that we're not willing to look at that and confront that as just as dangerous for society. So the danger is, he thinks, of detaching and despairing, of saying, well, what can be done? There's no point. It's overwhelming. It's somebody else's job or responsibility. Here, Bertolt Brecht, who we started with, helps us. Be honest about the darkness, but learn how, together, not as isolated individuals, but together, to live lives that illuminate. 
Hannah Arendt cautions skepticism of those who present themselves to us very readily as the representatives of an era. Think about our political class of leaders at the moment, <coughs> those who tell us that they understand, that they can read the zeitgeist. Be suspicious of them, she says. Instead, we gain more hope, she says, more sanity and more courage from the lives of those who allow themselves to be troubled by their times and to find ways to make those times their own. Struggling towards solidarity in whatever small way they can, that will always provide more illumination. In practical terms, that means learning to struggle together for the common dignity that keeps the lights on for all, that ensures food on the table of all, work that fulfills and rewards fairly for all, and helps overcome the poverty of intense loneliness. <coughs> that means lighting the pathway that begins with compassion, but ends only, not just with justice, but also with fellowship.